Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. The head of a Commerce Department in any state is a crucial role, and in South Carolina, it's doubly crucial because there's a new boss in town. I'm Chris William, and welcome again to the most widely watched and longest-running program on Carolina business policy and public affairs. Seen each week across the Carolinas for 30 years. Thank you for your support. This week, a one-on-one, -on -one, an executive profile with Harry Leitze. He is the new Secretary of Commerce in South Carolina. What is his plan coming out of COVID? And as momentum has been stronger than ever when it comes to employment and business in general, we start our dialogue right now. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, an executive profile featuring Harry Leitze, South Carolina's Secretary of Commerce. As I said, there is a new boss in town. South Carolina Department of Commerce now has a new secretary, relatively new. He is no stranger to the Palmetto State or to the Southeast for that matter. We are honored to have once again on this program in his new role, the Secretary of Commerce for the great state of South Carolina, Harry Lightsey. Your Honor, welcome to the program and it looks like you are staying healthy, I hope. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, it's an interesting time we're in, but uh, hopefully We'll be putting this behind us uh, as, as we get through this year. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it, it, no surprise to anyone, South Carolina has had it, the wind at, at, at your back in many ways when it comes to growth, uh, international investment, capital investment. Over the last decade, both with uh, uh, previous Secretary Hitt, but just in general with business, the, the, the bright glare of the growth of the Palmetto State's been, been pretty amazing. It, it, two questions, sir. Is that momentum sustainable? And What's your strategy going forward? Yeah, so let's let's break that down into two parts. I, first of all, uh, I would be, uh, of course, incredibly remiss if I didn't acknowledge the uh, uh, just record-breaking 11-year run of my predecessor, Secretary Bobby Hitt. Uh, 11 years in this job is uh, unprecedented, and what he was able to accomplish over those 11 years uh, is is really speaks for itself, as you mentioned. Uh, really an incredible an incredible record of, of accomplishment and certainly we should acknowledge that gives us a, a great uh, foundation uh, to come off of. Uh, we just announced uh, our 2021 uh, uh, numbers and uh, it was a record breaking year in, in a number of contexts. Even uh, dealing with the uh, pandemic, uh, we were able to uh, have over uh, right around $5.7 billion in uh, capital investment uh, in the state uh, and creating almost uh, 18,000 jobs in the state just in the last year. Uh, so uh, just, a, just a great record. Uh, as we come out of 21 into 2022, we currently have more projects underway in, in 2022 in January than we did in 2021. So we, we do have a lot of momentum. And, and that is, uh, and that's a good thing for our, for our state. Um, in terms of uh, where do we go from here, uh, what I have said uh, consistently since I, I took uh, the position is I really and truly believe that the next uh, five, 10 years in business are gonna be uh, transformative uh, for every business. And um, I think that uh, 
helping our existing businesses that are already here in the state deal with uh, many of these new technologies that are going to be brought uh, to the market and commercialized, uh, increased automation, artificial intelligence, uh, vast increases in, in the type of computing in the auto industry, which is very important to South Carolina, the conversion from the uh, internal combust combustion gasoline engine uh, to the, the battery electric vehicle. Um, these are transformative technologies that will really reshape uh, many, many industries. So I think existing uh, businesses in the state are going to have to have our help and support to figure out how to deal with these. But at the same time, all of these changes are going to create opportunities for our state. And uh, so we have to be nimble and we have to uh, really work hard to capitalize on the opportunities uh, that present themselves in the, in, the next, uh, in the next five to 10 years. If we do it well, I think that'll lay the foundation for another 50 years of growth in South Carolina. And, and that's tremendously exciting. So, Secretary Leitze, so, so you were very intentional about six months ago when you came on the job to look and listen. You went on a listening tour. What came out of those conversations that may have surprised you or you didn't expect? And how does that inform your strategy? Yeah, so uh, I had not, although I'm from South Carolina, I had not really been in the state in, in about 10 years. So, uh, as you mentioned, that was very intentional on my part to try to get around the state and talk to businesses uh, and talk to the people and, and hear what's going on. And, um, you know, of course, uh, what I learned was things are going incredibly well in many, many parts of our state. And um, uh, the biggest surprise to me, I think, was uh, when I left uh, 10, uh, 10 plus years ago, uh, many parts of our state were um, in, in pretty tough shape. They were experiencing very high unemployment. Uh, there was a lack of opportunity. Uh, they were very depressed in terms of their prospects. Uh, but today, um, of course, uh, uh, things are not uniform around the state, but I will say they are uniformly better uh, comparatively to, to where they were 10 years ago. Uh, so we had some counties in our state uh, 10 years ago with unemployment rates uh, approaching 20%. Uh, today, uh, we don't have a single county that is double-digit un unemployment, and even even our toughest counties are are in the single digits. And some of uh, areas of our state uh, are really at what I would consider a full employment economy. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest issue um, that I hear a lot from businesses that's kind of a, a big change for for uh, at least for my perception in South Carolina is, you know, we're concerned about our workforce. We, we don't know where our workers are, are gonna come from. Uh, we're having trouble uh, finding uh, people who, uh, who, who can, can fill the jobs uh, that we need to uh, thrive and grow as a business. So uh, that has probably been the, uh, the biggest expressed need uh, that I've heard. And it is certainly a significant change uh, from the past in South Carolina. And uh, one of our challenges is to figure out the right uh, things that we can do at the Department of Commerce, uh, working with uh, the folks in, in education, uh, working with uh, folks in, uh, in the employment uh, area uh, to really uh, help our businesses get the workers that they need. Do you, do you there, as you well know, sir, there's a, a, a pretty high priority on, on tax reform in South Carolina this year and uh, handicap that it could happen. Would you expect that meaningful tax reform will happen? And how does that change anything that you talked about when it comes to either workforce or capital investment? Yeah, so uh, as our governor mentioned in his State of the State address, uh, if you look at South Carolina in comparison to our neighboring states, mm -hmm. and indeed to many other states where we compete uh, for investment and, and for businesses to locate, um, our tax rates are relatively high. Uh, and so uh, the governor proposed uh, a reduction in, in the state income tax that would put us in a, in a much more competitive uh, area. Um, income taxes, uh, obviously uh, one factor 
there are other factors um, in terms of our tax structure. Uh, property taxes also are relatively high in South Carolina, uh, but uh, fortunately uh, counties uh, have the ability uh, when they're recruiting a business to come into a, a county to negotiate uh, a reduction uh, in that business's property taxes over time. Of course, uh, that doesn't help the businesses that are that are already in the county that don't ha enjoy those uh, tax advantages. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, it is it is certainly uh, something uh, that we are, need to deal with. On the other hand, uh, you know, tax reform is is a big lift and a very complicated uh, subject. And um, and so, you know, the legislature uh, will deal with that as it deems appropriate. Uh, and it's certainly the legislature is the decision making body here. We acknowledge that and um, we'll see what they do with it. Do you think there's a general uh, back to the tax reform idea and, and, and the odds that it may happen in some form or fashion? The idea that South Carolina's had more cash on hand historically than maybe ever before in recent memory? Does that embolden legislators to feel more at ease about enacting things that could have, like tax reform, that could have an immediate hit to total revenue? Does so, so this cash in general balances, you think that's a good thing? Well, so I think, and I've heard uh, legislative leaders and obviously the governor as well uh, say that uh, this uh, large amount of money that we're dealing with uh, in the state. Um, of course, our own uh, budget is running uh, a surplus mm -hmm. and has for the last year. Um, but uh, in addition, obviously, we have a lot of uh, federal money uh, to deal with uh, as uh, the federal stimulus uh, bills uh, from the pandemic uh, need to be to be dealt with. And so that the combination of those two factors is kind of what is created this uh, unique uh, opportunity where the, the legislature has this uh, historically large uh, uh, deal of money to, to deal with. Um, the governor has expressed his, his desire uh, that the legislature use this uh, unique opportunity to, to affect uh, transformative uh, changes, to invest in our state in a way that, that transforms the areas in which these investments uh, are made for the long term uh, and not just for an immediate uh, uh, hit, as you will, but uh, investments that can help uh, provide uh, the long term opportunity to better the quality of life for the citizens of the state and uh, and to to help the state uh, continue to grow and thrive. So uh, and I echo uh, the governor's sentiments on that. Uh, many of the legislator leaders, uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee has certainly echoed those sentiments as well. So I think um, in terms of, you know, what a legislator would refer to as one-time money, uh, money that they can they can make an, an investment with, uh, and, and it's just a, an immediate uh, thing that once it's spent, it's done, it doesn't recur, it doesn't come back. Uh, those seem to be the, the right uh, uh, philosophies uh, to deal with that money. Uh, in terms of you know whether our state uh, budget will continue uh, to run uh, this, the surplus that it has um, over the last couple of years, you know I leave that to the legislature and the economists. We're certainly hope, hopeful that we will do our part in commerce to continue to bring uh, business and, and help our businesses in the state. Uh, grow and bring new businesses to the state to, to help that uh, happen. But, uh, you know, it's it's uh, a question of of where the legislature is and feeling uh, how they want to deal with uh, any any um, prospects of uh, continuing uh, surpluses in the budget. But, sir, would you expect that the, the, the historic size of the surplus would also mean a greater amount for for commerce to have? To use for incentives, et cetera. Yeah, so we've um, we've proposed in our, in our budget uh, a, a new uh, concept, uh, which uh, kind of echoes these uh, sentiments of both the governor and, and the legislative leadership. Uh, we're calling it the uh, strategic 
economic development infrastructure. Um, and uh, what we would propose to do with this money if the, the legislature uh, uh, approved our budget request uh, would be to use the, that money to um, uh, seek out and, and opportunistically invest in uh, infrastructure uh, or in unique uh, opportunities uh, to provide a uh, platform for growth uh, for the future. Uh, currently, our incentive structure that we administer at, at Commerce to attract businesses into the state is tied to recruiting a particular business. And so a business commits that it's going to create a certain number of jobs uh, in the state, or it will make a certain amount of capital investment in the state. And in return for that, uh, we are allowed to uh, approve incentives for them, uh, tax incentives for them uh, as they make those investments and create those jobs. Um, but what I'm talking about here is the opportunity to make investments in infrastructure or in things uh, to be built in the state um, or to be created in the state that are not tied uh, to a specific business uh, coming here or to creating a certain amount of jobs, uh, but more would more provide a platform uh, that would allow us to recruit um, businesses in the state in the future. It, you know, kind of in the same vein, sir, the idea that if you get more money and if you're allowed, allowed's not the right word to say, I apologize for that, but if there is a, there's a general feel that commerce can operate with some I'll call it discretion, not secrecy, because the, the, as you well know, is the State House, the General Assembly, was critical of former uh, Secretary Hitt, but also Commerce that there was not enough transparency, and that happened almost two years ago. And and I know you were committed. What, some of your comments initially, when you first uh, arrived on on the scene in Commerce, were you were committed to transparency. So. Uh, given the, do you feel like there is a, it's a new day and there's a new relationship with uh, the state house when it comes to how you move forward, still be respectful around secrecy and around negotiations, but also keep those in the loop that need to know, but will also keep those things discreet as you need it. Sure. Um, and, and I will say, I, I, I think uh, I would acknowledge that uh, when I arrived here, uh, the, the, the department already had um, some uh, very uh, good initiatives underway uh, under Secretary Hitt to increase uh, transparency within the agency. And, and some of those uh, things that we've been able to implement uh, in the months that I've been here, uh, we have uh, committed to uh, additional uh, steps that we're going to take uh, to increase the visibility into what the uh, department is doing, um, but at the same time protects the confidentiality uh, of uh, information that would allow us to compete with our other states to attract investment and jobs, but, and also the confidential information of, of the particular companies uh, that are here in the state or that are thinking about locating in the state. So um, we have a number of things underway uh, and um, we will continue to look for additional opportunities uh, where we can increase uh, our, our transparency uh, because I do think, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, we are dealing with the taxpayers' money and the citizens' money, and they, they have a general right to, to know uh, what we're doing and how we're doing it, uh, absent uh, circumstances where, you know, we need to protect competitive in interests. Uh, for the good of the public. Uh, I will say that in terms of our uh, uh, strategic uh, development infrastructure money that we've requested, um, we've uh, put forward that we would we would uh, do whatever the legislature deemed appropriate in terms of uh, transparency and approvals uh, before that money uh, gets uh, spent uh, or committed. Uh, so we're we're committed uh, to full transparency on that and uh, to whatever uh, type of oversight that the, the legislature uh, deemed appropriate. Uh, Mr. Secretary, anybody that is a, a casual observer of, this, of the business of South Carolina is, is going to know that infrastructure is important, transportation, broadband, 
um, in your former life as a Bell South and an AT&T executive, you know a little something about uh, broadband and interconnectivity. When you, when you look at the challenges and the bottleneck in broadband has been identified as, as agreements with those that own telephone poles or, or, or power poles, how, how, how do you deploy that knowledge? How do you, how do you uh, lead and allow broadband to be more quickly deployed? Yeah, so broadband is, is certainly uh, a key uh, technology for, for the future. And uh, we want to see that uh, as broadly deployed around the state as we possibly can. Um, the legislature uh, has designated uh, the Office of Regulatory Staff as kind of the lead uh, state agency uh, on that. I'll, and we are working very closely uh, with, uh, with uh, the Office of Regulatory Staff as they uh, work to implement uh, uh, broadband expansion throughout South Carolina. One thing they have done, uh, and I've had several meetings with them, uh, they have successfully mapped uh, all of the entire state uh, in terms of broadband access. And so uh, we start out knowing uh, where we have broadband mm -hmm. and where we don't have broadband. And, and that is a tremendous advantage uh, because there are many states uh, that have no idea uh, what the where the the, the infrastructure is uh, that would allow them to expand uh, broadband in their state. So, I think South Carolina has uh, some unique advantages. First, uh, all we're geographically we're a small state, and so uh, frankly, um, uh, we are. are located uh, very close to each other. So you, you, as compared to some states where they have, uh, you know, very uh, long reaches uh, to reach uh, pockets of population. Um, and so just the, the geographic uh, nature of the state will allow us to expand our broadband reach um, more so than, than the challenge many other states would face, I would say. Uh, secondly, as I said, knowing where we have to do our work and where we don't uh, need to do work is uh, is also uh, a great asset for us to have as we really uh, start to to work with uh, our uh, telecommunications providers around the state uh, and figure out uh, how we want to expand broadband, how we want to enhance uh, broadband and in some cases, um, you know, broadband uh, assets were deployed a, quite a while ago, and now uh, they're somewhat outdated. They needed to, the, the type of bandwidth uh, that can be provided needs to be expanded, uh, those kind of things. Um, but uh, I think uh, we, have a, we, we have a good plan. We have a good start. And uh, I look for us to, to very quickly uh, expand uh, broadband throughout the state uh, with the support of, of the legislature. Uh, sir, we have about two and a half minutes, and I don't, I don't want to not give a little bit of heat and light here to uh, the whole idea of supply chain. Was 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 created a lot of angst before the holidays and for a while that the supply chain was disrupted, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, South Carolina has one of the premier ports in the country in the world. Um, but beyond that, the idea of overland traffic, of getting boats in, of, of ships in, of, of just the supply chain in general, do you feel like most of the biggest issues are behind us and now it's just a matter of time before that works through the system? And again, we have a couple minutes left. Yeah, so um, let me just acknowledge, I think, that the, the Port of Charleston is, is an incredible asset uh, to South Carolina and to the Southeast region. Um, and the, the legislature has made some great investments in terms of expanding our, our port. Uh, the Hugh Leatherman uh, terminal, uh, the dredging of the port are things that are coming online, you know, either this year or in the very near future. Um, and uh, that will increase the capacity of the port, which will be a great thing for, for the entire uh, region and particularly for South Carolina. Um, you know, I think uh, supply chain, uh, the one thing the, the pandemic showed many of our businesses is just how vulnerable uh, they have become. And uh, I think one of the opportunities we're going to have uh, over the next few years is I think that a lot of businesses are looking at onshoring uh, parts of their supply chain. Uh, and uh, so there is going to be uh, momentum uh, to bringing uh, 
business, uh, some parts of the supply chain, you know, back into the United States. And South Carolina with its um, really uh, strength in, in manufacturing and advanced manufacturing, I think is uniquely positioned to, to take advantage of that. We, uh, and when it comes to the ports, and it's not meant to be a leading question, but I would guess uh, President Jim Newsom has announced that he will be retiring. Barbara Melvin uh, has been clearly uh, the heir apparent. Um, I'm assuming you think there's not going to be much disruption with the transition in leadership? No, I, I don't expect that at all. Uh, Barbara has certainly been there. Uh, she has been in the number two position for quite a while. She understands uh, the port uh, and uh, has, uh, I think, all of the right uh, characteristics to to take over and continue to build to build our port. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you. I wish we had more time to unpack a lot of other things, but you seem to have plenty on, on your plate. But thank you for your leadership. Welcome back to the South and the Carolinas. And we uh, wish and hope the best to you. Stay healthy. I'm assuming you've been healthy and we'll hope that will continue. Yes. Um, so far, I've managed to, uh, to dodge the the virus, but um, uh, we'll continue to work on that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Best of luck. Until next week, uh, for all of you, thank you for watching. Stay safe. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.